Kia ora koutou, um, Dr. Enia Raumati from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm an emergency doctor in Auckland and I'm attempting to run eight self-supported multi-stage races on eight continents um, in a calendar year this year. Um, I've done four so far and I've got four more to go. Yeah, I see um, attempting is maybe kind of an understatement. You're halfway through, so it sounds like you're going to finish. <laughs> yeah, halfway through. <laughs> Still some big races to go, though. Yeah, you were saying your next one is uh, Romania, right? Yeah, so um, yeah, Ultra Race Romania seems nice. quite a nice, um, you know, small race, um, sort of small numbers, started by a guy that was just really into it. And um, they look after you quite well, and you go off to see Dracula's Castle if you finish at the end. So. <laughs> That's uh, that's worth it in itself, I think, to go see Dracula's yeah. Castle. <laughs> Something we've like, heard about, probably like all of us have heard about since growing up. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, like, where did this idea come from? Because I think a lot of people, at least in, in my experience, will run maybe a couple stage races per year because they're fairly intensive on your time, your body, and everything. And you're doing eight of them this year. So, like, where did this idea come from? And, like, why are you doing eight different stage races on eight different continents? You know, I've sort of been thinking about it for years. Um... For my 40th birthday, I did um, Racing the Planets, four races, their Grand Slam in a year. And I'm turning 50 this year, so it sort of worked in with that. But I've had this sort of plan of running a stage race on every continent in a year for some, quite some time now. And then it sort of turned into eight because there was a bit of a, um, a scientific sort of, uh, I don't know whether it was just a joke or a bit of a, whether it's true or not, but they say New Zealand's on its own continent now, so... Eight's a lucky number, so I thought I'd chuck New Zealand in there first as well. <laughs> so it's eight continents now. Um, but I guess the main reason is, one, you know, it's a personal challenge. I'm turning 50. And, and the other one is I'm sort of I'm raising money for a charity that we've set up back home to help, um, like, school-leaving kids um, run ultramarathons because um, it's quite a life-changing event for a lot of people. And... Um, Anyone you talk to that runs ultramarathons, they've always got really positive sort of stories to tell about how it sort of changed their outlook in life and, you know, how it's helped them and uncovered things about them that they didn't know. And we're wanting to get, like, sort of um, kids back home here in New Zealand that have sort of been struggling with personal issues or with schooling and things like that to, to take on one of these challenges and we'll help them to do it and hopefully sort of, like, you know, expose them to what they're really capable of and um, hopefully set them up for life. Yeah, it's interesting because like, like when I first started running, for example, it was just kind of like, oh, it sounds like a fun thing to do. And I was kind of up in the mountains. It was kind of like more of like a just go and explore and have fun type thing. But then you really realize it's like okay, it is kind of like a life changing thing. It teaches you so much on how to overcome challenges and frustrations and, and really just kind of like focus on things that actually matter in your life versus all these like little minor inconveniences, I think. Yeah. And I think especially when it comes to stage races, it's, um, I think a lot of people are surprised at how much you know, resilience or they actually have deep down when they start to do it. Like they, you know, initially they're really sort of apprehensive and worried about things. And then they find out that they've actually got more strength than they thought they did um, as the days go on. And at the end of it, you know, people that have thought about doing one and that's it for their life of always usually signing back up a couple of weeks later, once all the blisters have healed and things, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's always the joke, right? Like it, right after you finish, like I'm never doing this again. But then after a moment, you're like, I could do this again. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I could do it again. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just really fascinating. Like having been at a lot of running events myself and like grand to grand, obviously a lot. It's interesting how many people think like maybe like, okay, I, can, I can't do this or this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. And then they're able to get through it. And it's, it's really mm -hmm. fascinating to me, like how powerful the, the human mind and body can be once you like dedicate yourself to something. And I think it sort of resets your mind a little bit as well. Like initially with a lot of things in life, you like, you know, you write it off because you can't, you think you can't do it. But once you've mm -hmm. achieved it once, it's like your body and your mind realize, well, hey, that's actually doable. Let's try something harder. And that's why I think people get hooked into this sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always looking for the next, uh, the, what is it? What's the phrase? Like the, I don't know, whatever, greater thing, right? Like you're always just looking for something bigger and better and more challenging, I guess, would be probably the proper terminology. Yeah. And I, I think it's a good way to be in life. So yeah, like always challenging ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So what has it been like so far? So you've done four. Why don't we just mm. kind of go through them briefly? Because all I remember is you did Namibia, Mongolia, and there's a couple others I don't remember off the top of my head so far. Yeah, so I started with the Southern Lakes here in New Zealand, which because um, they're all roughly the same format. They're all sort of like, you know, six and a half days, um, you know, five and a sort of half stages. You know, you sort of run 
every day you run about a marathon and then they typically have a long stage where it's like two. So about 80 Ks, I don't know what that is a mile, sorry. <laughs> um, and you just, it's all, they're always self-supported carrying all your own gear. So I started out the Southern Lakes here in New Zealand um, in the middle of our summer, which was quite hot and quite, quite tough, but that was really good fun. Um, it was sort of like a, um, a good opportunity for me to sort of like finalize my sort of kit and trial out things because I'm here at home. And if you needed to change something, you could change it. <clears throat> and then I headed over to um, Namibia about five weeks after that in Africa. And that was probably, I'd like to say it's a nice race, but it was nice, but it was horrible because <laughs> they got up to a very, very hot, like really hot for them, like 55 degrees Celsius. Again, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. It's hot. Um, <laughs> it's a lot. And, uh, you know, it was just really hot and really hard on you. And it was sort of hard to eat and hard to stay sort of motivated. Um, but I managed to get through that one and then went off to, about three weeks later, went off to the, do the Jungle Ultra in Peru in, the, um, in their national sort of part, the Amazon part over there in the rainforest. And that was a bit different because you're sleeping in hammocks <laughs> and you've gone from like sort of 55 degree dry heat to this sort of humid <laughs> environment with like, you know, snakes and all the rest of it. Um, but that was great. I really enjoyed that one because it was quite physically quite tough. Um, and then unfortunately I had like a two week turnaround to go off to Mongolia, which I've just got back from. So that was pretty tough on the old body, but um, surprisingly came for okay. Yeah. So I think that's about what, oh, how many Ks now this year? What, about 1,250 or something racing? Yeah, that's quite a bit of racing kilometers in one year. We're only halfway through the year. This you were only half, <laughs> yeah, halfway through the challenge as well. So in Grand to Grand's got to be a little bit different, don't they? They had 275 or something just to chuck in an extra couple of 25 Ks to make it a bit more difficult. Yeah, it's definitely a little dynamic of a course. Like I, I imagine Peru is just like pretty hot and humid the whole time. Namibia just sounds very mm -hmm. hot and dry, but like Grand to Grand is like as you climb in elevation, the, the I don't know, the environment changes quite a bit. So that's going to be an yeah. interesting challenge. Yeah, I hear it gets really hot down when you're down low and stuff as well. It gets pretty warm. It's not 55 yeah. uh, degrees by any means, but it's pretty warm. It's pretty warm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's, um, I, if I remember right, like that race in Namibia is like fairly low elevation, but um, mm. Grand to Grand is like high desert. So even though it's not as hot, the sun is still fairly intense at these elevations. So it can definitely cook you if you're not ready for it. Yeah, no, I've been looking at some of the pictures and stuff and just like, going like oh, yeah, that all looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> People suffering. <laughs> Yeah, imagine by the time you have you have all these four done, you're going to have Romania coming up soon. By the time you get to Grand to Grand, you're going to have like an entire spread of like basically every type of environment. So you're going to be fairly well suited for for the for the trail at Grand to Grand. Yeah, so you do adapt a little bit. Like going from um, Namibia being so hot and struggling with the heat and that, got to Mongolia and people that hadn't been racing much this year were going like, oh, this is really hot. This is really, you know, really struggling. I was like, well, it's quite pleasant, really. <laughs> you know, getting up 40 degrees was quite pleasant. <laughs> compared to some of the other races so. yeah, i've always found that interesting like just perspective on things like if you if you're in a hot environment constantly that kind of just becomes like your normal right but then if you're always in a cold environment you're used to that and your body adapts and it's really interesting interesting to me like physiologically how your body can change and how your your mental outlook too as well like maybe it's the same temperature but you're you don't feel like it's as hot just simply because it's like your perception or whatever right yeah and it's just like yeah, people are like oh these hills are really hard and stuff and they were struggling and, you know, as everybody does, like, you have a bit of wind and stuff every now and then, but you get over it. And I was just thinking, oh, these hills are not too bad compared to Peru. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just like, even though you were tired and, you know, you just, I don't know, mindset was, oh, this is actually quite a pleasant race and I really enjoyed Mongolia. So, Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that because I imagine, like, at least like from my experience running, your experience running as well, it's like, if you think something's going to be hard, like, it becomes very hard. But if you go in with the proper mindset of like, okay, like, this is going to be a challenge, but I can do this. Like the mindset is just like it's such a critical part, I think, to completing an event. Like, do you feel like that's true? Oh, a hundred percent. I think the mindset's most of it when it comes to these sort of things. And like even a single day ultra, you know, once you've, um, once you've done one, your mind sort of realizes how you can achieve it and you can do it again. And you go in a lot more positive. 
I think initially a lot of people almost talk themselves out of things or they, they think themselves out of it, you know. And a lot of people that pull out early in the multi-day races are almost, they go to the medical tent and they're almost looking for an excuse for somebody to pull the pin on them. Whereas um, a lot of the medical crew, um, crews are quite used to it and they sort of talk them out of it and go like, no, nah, no, nah, you're right. You know, no, nah, I've seen worse blisters. <laughs> you know, your feet will recover, away you go. And as long as you sort of like get them over that initial, I want to quit, I want to quit, which is all in their head, they typically get to like day four or five and it's like, no one really sort of quits that late in the race. They'll quit in the first couple of days and it's all their thoughts in their head about, oh, how tough the next day is going to be and you haven't invested that much in the race. But once you get over that sort of hump of halfway, you know, people stop talking themselves out of things. And it's all just yeah. in their mind. Yeah, it's so interesting to me because like at Grand to Grand, we've noticed that as well. Like just looking mm -hmm. years past, it's like okay, the, the long day is like, it's hard. You have a lot of sand, a lot of climbing and it's, it's yeah. a long day. But then after that, like generally, if you complete that day, you're going to finish the race. It's like yeah. people come over, they go over that mental hurdle and they're like, oh yeah, like I can do hard things. I can do this. And they kind of become used to maybe that discomfort. And they can also see the light at the end of the tunnel and they realize that they can do this hard thing. Yeah, Grand Dugan is one of those tough ones where the long day is early. <laughs> like quite typical of a lot of other races, the long day is sort of like the second to last day. And then there's sort of like a short little finish off or whatever. But I think Grand Dugan is the third day or whatever. So that's quite interesting. It's quite early on. But yeah, I'd expect most people, if they're going to quit in the Grand to Grand, unless they have, unfortunately, a big injury, they're going to do it in the first couple of days. Once you've done that long stage, it's like, I don't care, you know? Don't care how messed up my feet get or how messed up my body gets. You know, you're just going to finish it. Because otherwise, you're going to have to come back and do it again. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> yeah. You can't leave things undone, you know? If you're, if you're doing it for a race, I mean, I think that's the worst thing. You'd have to go back. Yeah, I've definitely had those like personal experiences in my life where I, I don't have the quite I don't quite have the race I want to have, and then as soon as I'm done, I'm like I'm never doing this again. But then it's kind of like going back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like you get done, you're like I could do this differently, I could do this differently, and like you kind of have like that. I was gonna say the same phrase in New Zealand, but the monkey on your shoulder or the monkey on your back, like yeah, you always want to come back and do it again because you know you can do better, and it's an interesting thing that humans are we're like that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about Grand to Grand then. Like you, I think you mentioned you've been to the States a little bit when you were younger, right? Yeah. Um, I've sort of traveled through a couple of times. Once with a, a friend when I was at university, um, he just wanted to get away. <laughs> so he wanted to go to Vegas because he had some rough time at university with his girlfriend or something. So we did that once. Um, but uh, when I was at university, I also did like a working holiday um, driving um, shuttles for Colorado Mountain Express, actually up into like Vail and stuff and that was quite good fun. So I've been to the States a couple of times, um, really enjoyed it. So actually I'm looking forward to going back. Obviously um, the race, I think we fly into Vegas. I think my flights take me. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's generally the, the best place to fly into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so if I show up late for the race, just to send out the search party into one of the one of the casinos or something. We'll see you hustling all the at the poker yeah. table or something. Yeah, right? something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Kanab is like it's an interesting place where like it's a really beautiful little isolated town and like, there's no real major airports nearby. So like the fact that the fly into Vegas and then drive all the way up there and then it's just, like a drastically different type of desert environment from the Las Vegas desert to the Red Rock desert of, of Kanab. Yeah, it's one of those great sort of places, isn't it, where um, a lot of these races sort of take place where you fly in somewhere and it's usually a long bus trip or something to get to where you start. So um, nice and isolated. Yeah, I've been looking it up and um, figuring out, like, yeah, if I miss the shuttle, how I'm going to get there. <laughs> well, let's hope you don't miss the shuttle because it might be no. kind of a pain. <laughs> so I guess, like, I guess, I guess you haven't been here a couple of times, but, like, never really been to, like, the environment where the race is. Like, why did you choose yeah. to run Grand to Grand? Like, because it's a, it's a little bit different than the other events you've done. Mm, there was a couple of reasons. Um, one, it sort of like fitted in with the race schedule. But um, I'd already heard about it like in these like, I suppose when you, when you show up to these sort of ultra running things, quite often you'll run into people, the same people again and again with these sort of communities, the same sort of people that enjoy these things. And um, I've heard from a few competitors about the Grand to Grand. Um, now it's been on my sort of list of, races to do for quite some time for about the past 10 years actually and i've sort of never managed to make it over and then it sort of i was looking at it and it was like oh yep it fits in i really wanted to do it so signed up and 
you know, it's, it's the fault of every other American runner I've talked to in, in the tents in the past 10 years that I'm coming over because they've all talked it up. So <laughs> they say you'll enjoy it. It's nice and tough. <laughs> I think it's a good way to describe it. Nice and tough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't want to do something that's easy. No, yeah, exactly. Like I, I feel the same way. Like I think it's interesting now where there's a lot of races that are kind of like, okay, like make it as easy as possible. But grand to grand is it's a hard event. Like I guess every stage race in general is gonna be hard. I don't want to discount the other yeah. events as well. But like it's a it's a hard event where you're out there in this environment, self supported, and just it's rough. Like it can definitely be a, a long week for some people. Yeah, and I think that's half the appeal of to me of those self supported races is typically they are tough. Some of them, yeah, they're all tough. Some of them they start to like. um babysit people a little bit more now i guess you know they're really trying to get people through and they're trying to but i still like the ones where it's literally the rougher the better if they just let you loose and you know good chance of not finishing is always a good race to enter you know i don't like doing stuff where it's guaranteed that you're going to finish because that there's no challenge in that you know yeah i find that it's interesting like the human psyche i guess of like we're we live in a fairly comfortable environment and we like try to like challenge ourselves as much as we can. And it's pretty fascinating. I think that like we're trying to like do as hard of things as we can. And it's like, it's really interesting. I think. Yeah. Cause I mean, like I, um, like my work's pretty stressful and that, you know, that's a different sort of, um, struggle, I guess, you know, it's mentally stressful and you know, there's all that sort of stuff working as a doctor, but you know, physically you live pretty comfortably. Like I live pretty comfortably physically, you know, got a nice place to live and, nice environment and you know i don't struggle in that so but you crave it a little bit like you miss the things that you used to do when you were younger where you know like over you know military service or other things you know where things were a physical struggle as you get older you miss those little those little challenges you go out and sort of you hunt them down a little bit and that's what i found every year like even though you're getting older you still want to test yourself to see how you're going you know and these sort of events are sort of how I, um, at times I do it, I guess, you know, you crave that sort of like that darker side of, of fitness struggle a bit. No, I 100% agree with that. And it's really interesting how it's like, it's just so like innate and natural for us to like, to live that way. And we live in these kind of like really, like you were saying, like soft sheltered environments and yeah. we go out and we push ourselves and yeah. Like, do you, do you personally find it interesting to like go from being I don't know, like out in a stage race for a week or so, then coming back to like quote unquote civilization. And then you're, is this, is it, is this a weird contrast for you to go back and forth between those two things? Yeah. I usually find, um, especially now that I've done two in quite quick succession, like I've sort of really adapted to, you know, living in a tent and having to heat up your food and, you know, just all you have to worry about each day is you wake up, you put your kid on and you go for a run. And at the end of the day, you know, you, you take your kid off, you sleep in a tent, whatever. For me, it's quite a sort of a simple existence. It's quite, it's quite refreshing, really. I don't have to think about too much. You know, you've got a set pattern of how you do things. You don't have to really have that sort of mental struggle. And then you come back to civilization, as you put it, and you go to work, and all of a sudden, there's nothing really that sort of physical going on. But it's all just all this mental, nonstop sort of barrage of information and questions and, you know, and it's only so much I can handle of it before I want to go back to living in a tent. <laughs> no, I can imagine. Like I, I personally have never done a multi-day stage race, but even just going like backpacking or something for a few days and you definitely like, you put all these other things aside that like in the grand scheme of things that probably aren't that important. You really kind of like yeah. almost like self discovery where you're just away from your emails and your cell phone and all these things. And you can just actually think through problems. And it's like, it's almost like, why do we go back to these environments sometimes? Yeah. Like, I really like to disconnect. Like, quite often I won't take my cell phone. I know some people and races take their cell phones. The good thing about Grand to Ground, I think, is they've got, like, a no cell phone policy, I believe, which is great. And they just disconnect because I like it. You know, I don't take mine if I can help it and just really want to switch off and not sort of have any of that sort of work contact or electronics sort of stuff and just be around like-minded people where you just sort of wake up and it's like, hey, let's all go for a run, shall we? Well, we've got no choice. <laughs> so it's easy somebody's organizing your, your daily exercise for you yes yeah, i like going to boot camp or something right yeah yeah i just can literally <laughs> switch off most of your brain and just you know get back to just living quite a relaxed sort of well not really, you know, yeah relaxed sort of life i like it i'm quite relaxing yeah like it's, it's simple and straightforward you like you know your objective every day and you go for yeah. it like I, it's kind of the best i think <laughs> yeah quite refreshing yeah. 
Yeah. So like, just, I guess thinking of that, like, obviously like it, it's cool to be out there and everything, but like, it's still physically demanding on your body to go out and run for a week at a time. And a lot of people lose weight at these events because like, you're kind of not eating as much as you should or potentially could. And, but at the same time though, you have a really demanding job. So like, how are you able to travel, go to these events, run, go back to your work and able to like kind of rinse and repeat? Like, how do you, how do you recover between these events? And, um, my recovery is poor, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, I set myself up at the start of the year, uh, mainly with a lot of training last year. Like, I purposely um, went to the gym more, put on some weight, because um, I knew with all these events being so close that you're just going to lose weight. Um, and a lot of it's to do with, like, you, you lose muscle because you just can't recover in time. I mean, you physically can't recover, you know, in two weeks from one race to the next or even three Quite often, these sort of events, you need like you know a couple of months to fully recover. Um, so I did that at the start of the year. So I set myself up from last year, put on some weight, did that, um, and then sort of in between races, I really just sort of um, don't train that hard. Just sort of, you know, probably do less than what people think. Like I go out, you know, two or three times a week for a run, typically not more than twenty k's. And just go with friends and take the dog out and just really just relax and go slow spend more time sort of at the gym um, doing rehab type stuff and just really work on my diet and things as well like i think you know sleep and eating properly is probably the best things you can do and that's obviously where work decides to put a spanner in the works quite often um, like now i got back on tuesday it's thursday here afternoon i've got to go to bed soon to work a night shift and I'll be on night shifts from now till Monday morning. So that's not the best for recovery. But um, yeah. yeah. I guess you make it work when you have a goal in mind. You you do what's necessary to complete that goal, right? Yeah, that's the way I look at it when I'm at work. It's like, yeah, this is not the most ideal thing, but it's getting me the leave off work that I need to go do the things that I want to do. You know, so it's just a necessary evil. Yeah, I'd say work is a necessary evil. We can call it that. <laughs> yeah, you got to pay for these things somehow, you know. <laughs> they're great fun, but um, they're never cheap. And the travel, like you were saying, is quite horrendous. I mean, it's probably the worst thing about living in New Zealand is everything's so far away. You know, and flights are typically quite expensive to get from here to other places in the world, you know. Um, I don't think any flight for any race that I've had has been under, you know, 11 hours and then usually there's a couple of connecting flights on top of that as well. I think for Africa, I traveled, spent more time in the traveling than I actually did running. When you actually counted out the, how many hours a day that you ran and just added up the running hours, I spent more time traveling and in transit than actually running. So <laughs> that, that sounds extremely exhausting. Like I've been to New Zealand a couple of times and I was exhausted just going there for minor things and not running <laughs> stage races in between all the travel. <laughs> yeah. So typically I, I start to do better in these sort of um, stage races, probably about the third or fourth day. It takes me a couple of days just to sort of relax and get into it and then typically start getting a bit better. No, that definitely makes sense. Is your appetite just pretty huge once you get home and you start eating food again? Um, usually for about four or five days afterwards, I'm really hungry, but your stomach's so small that you struggle to, to eat. Um, now I've been, what, the race finished about a week and a half ago, yeah, now, and my stomach's got back to it. I'm just craving everything. Like, I don't think I've stopped eating in the past 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been great. Yeah, I guess that's one of the benefits, right? If you like to eat, you can just pound all the food you want and you know it's going to be utilized in the future. <laughs> yeah, and um, I guess when it comes to all this recovery and stuff as well, like in the race, I haven't you know, perfected sort of what you eat and how you eat and um, – you know, sort of what sort of supplements and stuff that you take to sort of help you recover has become a big part of it. I mean, I'm getting a bit of an old hand at this sort of stuff now, so I know what my body can eat, what it can't. And sometimes it never works out as you plan, but I tend to take um, backup food and different things, you know, a real mix. If you can't eat something, you can eat something else. Yeah, what is kind of your go-to? Because I, I always just find this interesting, like the things that people bring to eat, and it's always a variety, and... Like, I have my things that I enjoy eating, but, like, what do you bring when you go out? Or what's your kind of favorite food? Yeah, so for a multi-day event, like, most of it's dehydrated food is what you have to take. So it's the only thing that you can carry to keep lightweight. But sometimes, like, in Namibia, it was so hot, I just couldn't eat any of that stuff. But my go-to that I found that I can always eat is just really um, 
here in New Zealand, like you have cheap sort of two minute noodles. <laughs> so just, you know, cheap noodles and like packet soups. I find I can always eat that. So regardless, at least I can get something in. Yeah. Are those like, I don't know, here in the States, we have top ramen or maruchin noodles and they're just like very salty and whatever. Are those, are those noodles pretty salty as well? Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. like really salty sort of thing, like, you know, chicken or beef sort of flavor. And the good thing is like yeah. you can just crunch the packet up into like half its size, just crack all the noodles up. So you can shove lots of packets in your, in your, in your race pack. And I find that and, um, uh, like I carry some uh, Manuka honey sort of gels and stuff as well from back home here um, by a company, a local company, Manuka Performance. So I find that stuff as well works really well. So even if sometimes if I can't drink stuff, I can put some of that in a hot drink. And for some reason, just the sweetness of that in two minute noodles. <laughs> this kind of sounds like polar opposites health wise. You have the Manuka honey, which is kind of known for being a healthy, like very healthy honey. And you have the two minute noodles, which are probably not the healthiest food on the planet. Yeah, not the healthiest food. And then, um, like I've recently, um, you know, cause I've been using a supplement for a while, I've recently been sort of sponsored by currents and I take a black current supplement and I found that's been a bit of a game changer for me in terms of helping with my guts and sleep and things like that in an event. So, um, yeah, those are my main go-tos. Everything else, if I can eat it, it's a bonus. Because um, <laughs> typically by about the day three or four, we're all swapping food because you've typically got a bit of flavor fatigue and you want something else different. You, know, you see people sitting around swapping their meals. They're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it seems like a good way to make friends. It's like, oh, okay, I have something you want and, or I want and you have something that I want. And you can kind of just uh, make yeah. friends that way. <laughs> yeah, you always pick the first timers because they've always usually done something like they found one flavor of something that, that they find, oh, I really like this. And they'll bring along six days of the same dehydrated meal. And by about day three, they just can't. Yeah, they're just looking for any sort of swap they can get their hands on, you know. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Even just like on shorter, like single day runs, I get kind of flavor fatigue on the like certain gels yeah. and products, but like multiple days of the same thing, it just sounds yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah, you run a hundred miler, it's just like, you know, you just start craving odd things during it. If you've brought the same sort of like flavored, you know, electrolyte drink or, or snack for the whole thing, you don't want to see it about halfway <laughs> through the race. Yeah, you always got to take a break from it. <laughs> yeah, so I guess uh, as we kind of like start to wrap up here, then like I feel like and we kind of spoke about this already, but like there are so many things that you learn about yourself and just I guess people and mankind in general when you're out running these races. And it sounds kind of like I don't know, maybe like a little dramatic to say that, but like I do feel like we learn a lot about other people and about ourselves at events, especially multi day events. We're spending a lot of time with people that maybe like in a normal day you wouldn't associate with, like. Yeah. Like a lot, I meet a lot of people at running events where I'm like, hey, like if it wasn't for running, we wouldn't cross paths. And when you're at a stage race, like at Grand to Grand or something, you spend time with these people. Maybe you come from drastically different home environments or professions or whatever, and you can become friends that way. But like, do you feel like there's like something major? Or like, do you have a major takeaway, I guess, from the four stage races you've ran so far this year? Yeah, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head with that. Like, I, I love the stage races, I guess, because it's that environment after the race as well you know, where you're sort of all sitting around um, having a chat, you know, talking about different things. And like you say, you come across people you'd never meet. And quite often they're doing it for different reasons, but they all sort of get the same thing out of it, I think. You know, they discover more about themselves. They typically discover that they can, you know, push themselves harder than what they always thought they could. And, um, you know, then they try to talk their mates into it. I guess, you know, and that's half the reason why we've um, set up a scholarship in New Zealand as well. It's just to ex expose people to that. And I think the biggest takeaway I would give away is if people are listening to this and thinking, oh, you know, should I, I can't give one of these a go, you know, I'm just not fit enough, I can't do it. You know, that's just, that's just your mind telling you that you can do it. I mean, there's people that come along to these things that you would look at them and you think there's no way that person's ever going to finish an event like this. But they do, you know, and it's just because they've just got that mindset of they really want it, you know, and um, no matter what happens, they'll just keep going. There's the odd one, obviously, that can't make the cutoffs and things like that, but um, typically they'll come back another year, give it a go and do it. But the ones that just stick with it, they can do it, and it's just all in your mind. 
Yeah, definitely. And I guess you mentioned your scholarship too. Like how, how can people find that? And if they wanted to, can they donate to that? Um, yeah, so we've, um, we're taking donations and stuff. We've also got like a little give a little page. Um, it's called Kia Mau, Kia Ora, which is a, um, a Maori phrase here in New Zealand. It's all about sort of, um, you know, reaching up and sort of punching for sort of barriers of conception about what you can do to sort of like live your most fulfillest life that you can. Um, so it's K-I-A-M-A-U and then K I A. O R A, if people can understand my accent, um, <laughs> and we're just going to give a little page for that, and um, we're looking forward to like next year getting our first group of kids into it. Cool, that's awesome. I'm sure all those kids will appreciate it. It'll definitely be a life changing experience for them. Well, we hope so. Yeah, we're looking for more like you know the sort of struggling kids back home with schooling and um, people that don't sort of have that sort of you know supportive environment, and we're going to try and hopefully. Um, provide that sort of environment for them and show them that they're worth a lot more than what they think they are. Awesome. This seems like a great cause to run for and probably something you keep in the back of your head while you're out there. Yeah. It's always sort of sitting in the back of my mind about how I can uh, do things a little bit better, or how I can make it a little bit better and how we can get the scholarship up and running better. No, that's great. Well, well thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. It was no fun to, to talk about this and I'm excited to have you come out to Kanab and, experience the desert out here it's incredible yep i'm looking forward to it we just um i've always wanted to go play with some scorpions and stuff like that so <laughs> we'll have to find some scorpions and rattlesnakes for you while we're out there that's the one awesome <laughs> we do have a, a runner just real quick who um he's a survival expert and he's running this year and he's known for just like kind of living off the land and all these different things so um oh. if anybody matt graham can find <laughs> find some scorpions and snakes for you or something that's great because we've got nothing over here that can hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. And New Zealand's a pretty uh, safe island when it comes to animals, right? Yep, it's pretty safe. <laughs> there. There's no critters that can hurt you. A little bit different out here, but <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, and I'm excited to see you this fall. Cool. Thanks, Eric. We'll see you soon.